and my father uh, in a very real sense of being a parent avoided me from then okay. on even and one of the ways he avoided me is working in his business from 9 a.m to 11 p.m and then getting drunk at 11 p.m so he could go to bed and i was responsible at age 10 for mixing his drinks <laughs> so uh but and he was always very angry with me and I never knew where the next shot was coming from. He would rush upstairs. We lived above the business and uh, he would have, I guess, a lot of stress from the business. And he'd come upstairs and dump some of that on his five children, me being one of them. And uh, what, wait, by by dumping, verbally dumping or physically swinging his fists or what? No, uh, uh, orally speaking, you know, being angry. Yeah. Uh, he didn't really beat me, but he did beat me emotionally. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Which which now brings me to this this point I was trying to make a little earlier, and I was trying to find the right words. Um, yes, abuse. Yes, emotional beating, if you will, etc. But what I'm looking for is, and suspicioning, is that underneath all that, we're always concerned about your response to it, not what happened. Because we can't change what happened. We can't change the fact that he was abusive and did all this. That's just, it's like trying to change the baseball score. It's not going to happen. Okay. Yes, exactly. But it's your response to it that we're working on now. The response in there, while we're using terms like revenge and things like that, okay, um, the response that I'm hearing is, I'm, your response, I'm not lovable. Something's wrong with me. I don't count. I'm defective. Exactly. All of those, Gary, right on. Okay. All right. So those are, depending on, I mean, most of us, you know, when we get some criticism or some form of abuse, whether it's really heavy or light, um, when we're children, we, we pick up some kind of a belief in that to one degree or another about, oh, something's wrong with me. What did I do wrong? And so we have to deal with that until it, it gets resolved. But when it gets really big time, ooh, you know, that's the kind of thing that can develop you see, our systems don't want to carry that. We don't want to carry around the belief that we're not lovable and, and you know, all that stuff. Okay. We, we just don't want to do that. Yeah. And so it, but if it's there, we've got to do something with it. We just don't leave it there. <laughs> we project it out. We have anger stuff. We do something. We project it out. We blame other people. I see you nodding your head. Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Now. Well, go, go ahead. All right. I want to I shift on this for a moment. It's easy to see from what I said, how that's how you would respond. You've been nodding your head and yes. And we got that. Okay. We have that at least academically in our head. I don't know if we own it yet. That's a different level. We're going we're gonna to try to move there. But where I want to go for the moment is to shift from you and your reaction to your father. We're trying to get behind this. This is all, these are all reframes that we're trying to do before we ever get the unseen therapist. Okay. Your father, why would he behave the way he behaved? See, I am guessing that in his background, somewhere in there, he was, abused, rejected, criticized, this kind of thing. That's why he drinks a lot. That's why he has stresses in business and lays it out on all his children and has to project it out, project it out, project it out, project it out. How am I doing? You're doing exactly right, because as he was growing up, he had to quit school at age 10 because it was the middle of the Depression, and his father left 
the family before he was 10. And his mother, my father's mother, my grandmother, was one of the most critical, grouchy, unpleasant people I've ever met in this lifetime. And she was always criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. Sure. Unfortunately, when he got married, he married a woman who criticized, criticized, criticized. <laughs> well, yeah. All right. So what I'm trying to see, what we, what we eventually want to get to here, this is going to be a good start type session. Okay. It's a, it's a launching pad for getting more into this, but we want to open the door to true forgiveness. That's where you're going to have the peace on this. We, but true forgiveness, and I'm being a little theoretical now. Okay, this has to do with my book, The Unseen Therapist. Anybody listening in, by the way, links to that book are in the essential links below this video. <laughs> but the whole idea of true forgiveness in the, in the ultimate spiritual sense is that we recognized that this experience we're having, seemingly in separated human bodies, is an illusion. It is a dream, and it isn't, it isn't even real. However, we did a good job with it because it is very convincingly real <laughs> to us, okay? <laughs> but our ultimate reality is a oneness, a more spiritual thing, and quantum physics has proven that for us, that we are not separate, even though it appears that way. This is an illusion. But so true forgiveness is actually to get to that place. Now, I'm not expecting to get, that, get there with this session, and that's a big process. But we can go a substantial step towards that by moving towards understanding, not just academically. Oh, I understand where my father came from and my mother, and I understand the criticisms they've had to deal with and that they're projecting things out and trying to deal with the world. That's an understanding academically in the head. How am I doing so far? Just right on. Right okay. On. But what we need to do is not just understand it academically, is to own it. Is to own it. Yes. Right. And that's where we're, I'm hoping we're going to bring an unseen therapist to see if we can't start in that direction. It's not a way with the hand thing, typically. But we can, I would hope, get a good, good start and get there. So eventually you go, well, that was his issue. I don't need to carry it around anymore. Okay. Not just academically, but really yes. get it. Okay. Now, I'll look at my notes here for a second. Tell me, I, I, when, we, when we begin, before this recording began, um, you said there were a couple of things we needed to get to forgiveness. We just talked about that and trust, including trust of other people. Yes. Now. Let's talk about that for the moment. For, let's talk about the ability to trust other people. <laughs> one, one of the things that happens Dave, when we think we're all separate from each other, that means we have separate interests and we are bound to conflict. I'm looking out after me, you're looking out after you, and so is everybody else looking out after themselves. Okay. <laughs> and the one thing we can trust is that they're going to look out for themselves. <laughs> Am I right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that would be true for you as well. Yes. Okay. Now, I think, Dave, I could... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think, Dave, I could trust you and loan you a hundred dollars and you would pay it back to me. Yes. yes. I have that trust in you. Okay. Great. Now, it may be that I would loan you a hundred dollars and you just stick your tongue out of me and say, Thanks, Gary, but I'm not going to pay you back. Okay. <laughs> 
And some people would do that. Hmm? Some people yeah. would do that. They are looking out for themselves. Yes. That we can trust. That we can trust. Okay. Yes. What we tend to do is try to measure other people's trustworthiness. Hold on. I got this phone coming in. So we have to trust other people. And we, it's just, I'm smiling. It's somewhat comical, but we can trust them to look out for themselves. Okay. We can do that. Okay. <laughs> so tell me, Dave, as a practical matter, what can you trust other people to do? Why, why, I, I, I'm saying it differently. Why do you have a trust issue? Why? Why? You've been burned? Okay, yes. Well, it starts as early uh, with other people at, uh, you know, age five when my father deserted me uh, emotionally as a parent. It happened uh, continuously with several people in the family who were always two faced. You could never trust uh, them. It happened horrendously when I was age 14, when four of my peers at school rejected me totally. <clears throat> and, uh, and I could go on and on with those experiences. But my understanding, Gary, is the reason all of those are continuing is I've never dealt with forgiving or letting go or understanding. Yeah, okay. Well, we're going to start understanding some of this stuff. One of the things that People do. You do it. I do it. Anybody listening in does it. And if people listening in say, not, not me. Well, I'm, I'm saying, think again. <laughs> <laughs> Is well, that we are, we are always, always, always looking out for ourselves. And, and we are, because because we think we are separate and because we're aware of all the conflicts going on and because we're aware of we, we haven't led, led really a pristine life, there's a lots of things that we've done that we maybe like to redo guilt-wise and all that kind of stuff. Everybody is subject, everybody is subject to that. One of, the, one of the things that we tend to do is to elevate ourselves at other people's expense now a very simple example of this and by the, the reason we're doing this is all reframing type stuff we want to put as much as we can on the table for unseen therapists when we finally get there so we talk about these things and we we try to reframe and loosen up a little bit so we're willing to let go of more things by the time we get there okay so anyway one one example of this Elevating oneself is the very simple example of something that everybody does. In fact, we tend to do it frequently, sometimes daily. Okay. And that is we gossip. You and I would be talking about somebody else and we would say, well, they did that. You know, the implication of it, I wouldn't do that, but they did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know where I'm coming from, right? Yes. yes. Okay. And so it just seems sort of mild and all that. But if you'll think about it, what they're doing is they're elevating themselves at somebody else's expense. Okay. When you have bullying in school or whenever it is some, is there's something to bullying, that's another example of, as an exaggerated example of gossiping, the bullies are, are trying to put somebody else down so they can feel better about themselves. I am the one in control here. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so the, the kids in school, that is a way for them to feel better about themselves. Dave is that, and I'm not. Am I right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's, you can trust them to do that, by the way. Maybe not this particular person or that particular person, because maybe they're a better friend than, and wouldn't do that or something. Okay. But somewhere, someone out there is going to do it. Okay, or going to be inclined to do it or whatever, because they feel unrest about themselves and need to elevate themselves else uh, compared to somebody else. Yes. And, you, and you are the target. 
Yes. All right. I was the target. And if I look back at it and I don't want to admit it, you know, I, I was on the other end of it from time to time, N not in the exaggerated sense, but yeah, I can look back and say, Oh, you know, you know, I remember this gal, this was like second grade, I think. And she was a classmate. I didn't remember her name. It was, it was Alicia was her name. And compared to the rest of the kids, she wasn't very attractive. I remember she had dark hair, but she had very large eyes, very large eyes. And kids would look at her and gossip behind her back. Ooh, Alicia, you know, you don't want her playing with us because she's got the big eyes or something like that. And I remember going along with that. I look back at it and go, no, boy, if I could turn back, I would sit down with Alicia and she'd be my very good friend and we'd start talking and so on. But not then, not then. No, no, I needed to elevate myself. And Alicia was somebody I could, with my other friends, put down. Mm. Right. Did you ever do that? Something like that? Yes, yes. The point of this is we can understand where people come from. That doesn't mean we excuse the behavior. That's important to understand. We're not excusing your father's behavior or anybody else's who lost your trust, so to speak. Um, we are moving towards understanding it. And you do it yourself. Yes. Okay. And you've had anger out, out, outbursts. I, I know we've talked about this before. You've, you know, other behaviors and so on. And all of us do, everybody, including those listening in. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, do, these, do these things. All right. So if we want freedom from th we want forgiveness, trust, and this kind of thing, we want freedom from these things we first we need to understand where people are coming from now let me shift back for a moment we're still reframing but i'm going to get back to your father and your mother for that matter would i be correct in assuming that your fathers and your mothers one of your fathers and your mother's greatest needs if not the greatest need would be love Oh, you bet. Big time. Big All time. Right. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> if they had really experienced love, they really felt loved, would they have the behaviors they had? No, no. Absolutely okay. not. Absolutely not. Okay, we're still kind of academic here, but we're in reframing, but I'm getting from that that the real issue here isn't whether they were abusive to you. It's whether or not they have love for themselves. Yeah. I, I never thought of it that way, but you're right. Yes. Now, your response to it is, you know, I, I'm perfectly acceptable. I mean, you're a, you're a young kid, you're abused all over the place. You're being told you're no good and in various forms and you know, you're not lovable and all that stuff. Well, that's your response to it. Okay. And got it and got it. And we're going to try to do something to ah, bring a little peace to that. Okay. And that's why we are doing all this reframing. Um, I'm inclined at the moment to bring an unseen therapist and start and now that we've done some reframing and this kind of thing, bring her in and see if we can't do some bring some more peace to all of this forgiveness and so on. Does, does it seem right? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to do, I'm going to narrate the whole thing. It's going to be easy for you. You just close your eyes and go along with it. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I want to get, I want to 
add something else in here. This is going to be an, a joint effort. It isn't just you and me. It's you and me and the unseen therapist. So we're going to be working together. And what that means is, as I start narrating stuff, I'm just going to be narrating stuff that happens to come to me. I'm going to be open to unseen therapists. And it's going to show up in whatever way it shows up. But as we're going through this, your job in all this is you know, to go along with what we're doing. But if something comes up, another thought, another idea, another thing to inject or whatever feel free to interrupt say oh gary a thought just occurs and we'll talk about that and inject that into what we're doing so it's a joint thing understood yeah you want me to interrupt while we're actually working with the unseen therapist? sure sure oh, okay oh i just had this thought Gary. i just had this memory or i just this thing now occurs to me or whatever okay if that it may not happen if it does happen, though, it's an input. It's an input. To, to me, that's likely unseen therapist saying, as we're going through this for you, pointing something out to you. And we might as well just inject it into what we're doing. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, let me start off here with a second. Like, um, we've been doing some reframing and all that. I should have done what we're about to do even before we did all the reframing about the parents and the unrest within that we all have and the rejections and the gossip and all the stuff we did. Um, and that is, I needed to get some sense of a before on a zero, a zero to 10 before on your intensity. And my guess is probably lower now than it, than it was when we started, but Guess for me, if you would, before we before we ever even started this conversation, 10 minutes before we had our Zoom thing here, if you had tuned into these issues, tell me what number of scales zero to 10 you would have gotten to. That's so-and-so father of mine. What? what? Let's just take your father for the, for the moment. Okay. I, I, I'm trying to get a before intensity okay. so ten. we can measure. Ten, okay. <laughs> so, so just to, just to reiterate, yeah. if you had focused in on some of the stuff your father did and said, and what it thing, your anger, would it be anger? Uh, yeah. Anger and hurt and fear. That's that father, mother, or both? I think both, but most strong with the father. What did you and call I, your, what did you call I, him? Did you call him dad or father or what? I really didn't call him much of anything. Okay. Uh, but, but I guess dad, you know, we just did not hit it off at all. And he'd, you, you, he'd run upstairs and say, David, you're rotten. David, you're rotten. Uh, or you're so lazy, you stink. <laughs> and things like that. And it just... Uh... I'm making a note. And he used to say, I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you which I think is where some of the acid reflux is coming from <laughs> that I'm, it's, but uh, his mother, I'm sure told him that I can't stomach you. And she wound up with uh, uh, a lot of stomach problems. But what was it? David, David, what? I can't stand you. What, David. Yeah. Uh, David, that, I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you. David. Yeah. Okay, I want to write yeah. that down. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's bring an unseen therapist. Okay. Okay. And uh, just as a little preamble to this, uh, uh, when you get the recording, this session is likely to be the type that once you have the recording, you can run the session over and over and over again. Because my guess is, the more you run it, 
the deeper it's going to go for you. Okay. okay. Let me uh, go ahead. Can I just mention one thing when, when you were asking uh, about whether it applied to my dad, I had a direct feeling over my heart. You know, it wasn't, uh, it was just a sense of awareness of that going right to the heart. Uh, in a good or bad way or what? I guess in in sadness, uh, in in um, feeling bad about not being able to forgive him more. All right. So I think what you're telling me is, in addition to the emotional ten, the anger, hurt, and fear at thinking about your father and the various things that he did, that you were having physical feelings in the heart did i say it right yes you did right Gary. Oh, okay one other thing i think i want to do before we do that is among these things you're so lazy you stink david i can't stomach you oh and i can't stomach david among those two which one stands out as more impactful to you? I can't stomach you. All right. I'll make a little note here. I can hear him say that. All right. Can... Mm -hmm. And that happened frequently or once you can remember or? Yes, yes. Well, it... we're going we're gonna to call that a specific event, even though it happened lots of times. Okay. What, what was the, as far as you can remember, what, at what age were the earliest time you can recall that being said to you? Eight comes to mind. Okay. Eight, age eight. We don't, we don't have to be accurate. It's just mm -hmm. approximate will do. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So we're being an unseen therapist. So if you would, Dave, just close your eyes. And uh, take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. And you've been through this before. So just to invite unseen therapists, just simply recall a loving moment in your life and nod your head when you're there. Okay. You're there? No, I'm just beginning. <laughs> okay. Uh Okay. All right. Good. Good. That's just the invitation. Unseen therapist is always listening and always guiding. <laughs> We're the ones who aren't listening typically. Okay. <laughs> but for now, but for now, we're we're going to focus here, and we're inviting unseen therapists. Just basically saying, okay, we're going to give you something to work on. Unseen therapists. And we've put some stuff on the table already. All right. And so we're going to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to hand it to you and let you deal with it. We, we're tired of it. Okay. <laughs> so let's turn back the clock. Let's focus at a time oh, around age eight. And your father, of course, has been criticizing you, abusing you emotionally in many, 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 many ways. But one that stands out is him saying, David, I can't stomach you. And that's a, that's a 10, as you recall it. Now, unseen therapist here's that and there's more to it than just well let's just do a little something with that because that represents lots of things and we're going to be expand this from just a specific event we're just going to launch off this specific event to many many other areas and again dave anytime anything comes up that uh, you well, want to in inject please do 
Yeah, I this is as soon as you started mentioning uh, this, I started to feel like I wanted to cry when recalling at age eight, dad saying, David, I can't stomach you. The, the great sadness. I didn't cry, but I felt so sad because I could feel him uh, overpoweringly um, saying this. And I felt so bad. About yourself? Yeah, I, I felt so deeply hurt. Yeah, okay. All right. Big time hurt there. So we're going to pause for, uh, there's many more things we're going to do with this, okay? But we're going to pause for the moment just on that hurt issue, all right? We're now going to give this to unseen therapists, just that isolated hurt issue. David, I can't stomach you and this hurt that you're feeling. We're recognizing, of course, that, that uh, he's reflecting his own unrest. You know that at least academically at this point. Okay. Nonetheless, there's little you heard at the time, but we're concerned about your response now. It's still a hurt now that you're feeling, right? Okay. Right. You're nodding your head. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, going to give it to Unseen Theory, and we're going to represent it metaphorically, like within you is this volcano and you manage to have the lava not erupt but sort of be at a low level most of the time boiling lava down there ready to erupt okay and that's all that hurt down there and now it's starting to now that you're remembering it is starting to bubble it's starting to begin uh, the erupting stage. Unseen therapist understands this. She sees it. You understand as, a, as an adult, it doesn't need to be there, but nonetheless, whether it's supposed to be there or not, it is. So unseen therapist says, okay, Dave, let's you and I just exit this scene for the moment. Just you and I go sit on a cloud and let's have this cloud hover over the opening, the top of this volcano and look down and look at all that. And let's recognize, let's recognize that that lava doesn't need to boil. That lava is there because it's unresolved. It doesn't have peace and so that lava brings steam off of it and the steam goes up and we can as we sit on the as you and the unseen therapist sit on the cloud here comes this steam an unseen therapist in her gentle understanding way says dave that's lack of love down there what that what that what that that's dave needing love and so let's you and I just generate some love here. We're apart from it now. And I will help you, says Unseen Therapist, with whatever love you think you need to have, because I've got, I'm overflowing with love, and I'll just, you can have all my love you want, because it's inexhaustible. And so the two of us then take that steam with the love, and we convert it into a love rain. Something like water, but it's love. And it begins to fall down into the volcano. Your love, your understanding. And it hits the lava. And the lava begins to quiet down. 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 Peace. Now we're going to do this again. We look, down, we look down from the cloud, you and unseen therapists, and you see in all that bubbling lava, you hear the words coming up. David, I can't stomach you. 
Here comes the steam in the form of, David, I can't stomach you. And then you turn that into loving rain that comes down. And the David, I can't stomach you goes, David, I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you. I really don't like myself. And I'm blaming it all on you. That's a mistake. Have peace. Now, we'll do this again. Bubbling lava. David, I can't stomach you. Up it comes. Ah, not so impactful this time, but a little steam. Unseen therapist and you. Develop rain. You understand this. You understand where he's coming from. Down goes the rain. I can't stomach you. I can't stomach you. I, I actually love you. I just don't know how to do it. I don't love myself, says your father. What I need is love. Thank you. Thank you for this effort. And then again, we're looking down the bubbling lava. Not bubbling so much, but some steam, the gentle rain, the loving rain coming down. I can't stand you. Well, that's my error, says Father, who finally gets it. And within you, Dave, as all this is going on, is a sense of understanding, a sense of peace. I've been carrying this around all these years. And at the essence, it has been my father's issue, not really mine. I'm looking for freedom here. Now, with the eyes still closed, Dave, how are you doing with this? Are you resisting it? Is it working? Tell me. Good question, because I didn't want to interrupt. I thought it was what you were doing was so good. But I some part of me and I'm pretty sure it was the ego uh, was fighting that in in the sense or the way of uh, reacting with, oh, that's malarkey, you know. Uh, but I tried to push that away, but it still was present. Yeah, okay. Very important feedback, very important input. It's real, okay? It is, we're not just doing some theoretical thing and everything's going to go away. We need to have all the input we can. So you didn't say it, but let me ask you in all that. Are you saying, ah, oh, but yeah, but he still, he still deserves my anger. Is that in there someplace? Um, it, it was implied with what the ego was doing that he still deserves this anger. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, and that other input into Unseen Therapist, he says, well, Dave. Is it right? Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm trying to put the words around it. I haven't gotten the words out yet, okay? <laughs> um, unseen therapist is saying, well, Dave, yeah, see, now this is your response to this. It is your response. Now, remember, one of, the, one of the things your father needs the most is love. If he had that love, if he really had the love, he wouldn't be behaving the way he behaves. I see you nodding your head now. Yes. Okay. Big nod, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, if you want to, Dave, be his punisher, his executioner. You can do all that. You know, that's sort of like being putting somebody in jail, which in a way you're doing with your father. Okay. You're putting him in a jail. Got him locked behind bars. You deserve all of this, etc. The, the only thing wrong with that is when you put somebody in jail, you are the jailer and you're, you're in jail with them. 
because you got to look out after you got to make sure they don't get out. <laughs> you got to make sure that they're, they're having lots of punishment and feeling bad and starving or whatever else you need to do to them. You're smiling, but tell me what's going on. It, that's a very good point because I have done just that numerous times with the resentment recording on the OEFT site. Uh -huh. And I, I have the same reaction, you know, I, it just does not connect in me. I, I don't want to accept that as being true for me, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I, I reject it. And I guess that's the ego, but it's like, I don't want to even think of letting him off the hook in any way. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, says unseen therapist. Okay. You can hold on to it if you want to. And, and, and believe me, if you really want to do it, I can't, you, you are so powerful. You are as powerful as I am, says unseen therapist. If you don't want to go there, that's yours. And if you want to be in your own prison, that's okay. I will, <laughs> I will love you anyway. If you want to be, if you want to be the, no, I will, I will love you. I will love you. It's okay. Yeah. But tell me, Dave, what benefit do you get out of keeping your father in this prison of your making? Well, it's insane, I know, but it's it's the ego saying, I, I'm right, I'm right, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's he's big time wrong, you know. And uh, well, you probably I mean, are. You probably are right, and he probably is big time wrong. Okay, well, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. In fact, wait, wait, wait. Unseen therapist now says, Dave, I, with all of my authority, hereby deem you. You are right, and he is wrong, and so be it for all time. Huh. Is that good enough? Now, what I want to do really, really, really at the deepest level, I want to forgive him completely. Yeah. And forgive myself. No, I, I, the ego, that damn ego has so strong, you know, uh, making everybody and everything wrong. And of course, my dad, most of all, you know, and that, has been causing so much horrendous problems, you know, not wanting to let go one little inch. You okay. know. Well, it so is your, I, go ahead. It, so I really, really need the help of the unseen therapist to get to a new place with this crap of holding on because I recognize it doesn't serve me, it has not served me, and I certainly can't get to a place of forgiveness or even understanding with hanging on to this, you know. Okay. Well, one of the reasons I told you before this session, Dave, that we're recording it and you can run it over and over and over again, because these, these points, in fact, what you just said, as you hear it over and over again, Hopefully, we'll start loosening it. But if you absolutely insist on holding on to this, you have the power to do that. And well, unseen, I don't, see, I, I don't want the power to do that. I would like to have the unseen therapist wave her light over my entire beinghood and just take all that away because I, the ego part of me, uh, wants to obviously hang on to it, uh, to be so uh, righteous, you know, all that baloney. Um, but I recognize I really, really need to get to that place, but I don't have the, uh, it seems like I don't have the power to get there on my own. Yeah, okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to keep, keep working on it. We're going to keep working on it. Okay. So, you, you, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Dave, you um, study A Course in Miracles. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, in okay. fact, I, I even taught it, believe it or not, if that's okay. not. Yeah. All right. Well, one of, the, 
one of the phrases, one of the little questions that the Course in Miracles asks, and for those not familiar with it, it's a spiritual set of readings, and I read it myself and so on. But one of the questions it asks is, would you rather be right or happy? Okay. I knew you were going to say that quote. I've <laughs> thought of that so many times. <laughs> yes. All right. All right, let's shift for a moment. Let's do a little something different. Let's imagine your father. We're, we'll leave the volcano aside for the new metaphor. There's your father standing in front of you. In your mind's eye, in your imagination. And you can notice the tension in his body and the sternness maybe in his face and the look in his eyes and as he may say david i can't stomach you okay or any of the other things that he may have said all right said done implied etc and there he is go ahead dave i i'm starting to cry and i i it, it, i'm starting to cry like a feeling sorry for my dad and i guess to some degree for myself but uh, that's unusual <laughs> well it's also a, i'm hearing a step in the right direction yeah does it seem that way yes yes it does okay all right well let's see. but there he is there he is now one thing you know about him now as an adult anyway is that he's been criticized, abused in lots of ways himself. Yes. Does not even know what love is, probably. Or if he does, it's a very light version of it. He's been, yeah, I see you, I, well, blowing your nose, but I see you're wiping the tears and so on. Yes. Okay. yes, yes, yes. All right. But there he is. No one has ever really loved him. Yes. He's had to be on his own. He's had to deal with all the criticisms, all the beliefs that were embedded in him, just like with you, that he's no good, something's wrong with him, he's not lovable, and all of this. He's gotten through life anyway, not in the most peaceful of ways, but there he is. He's a reflection of all of that. And he has, he's got his own volcano inside and it erupts and he has to do something with it. It is just too damn hot in there to do anything other than project it out somehow, do something with it. And so while we're not excusing the behavior, We're going to go through a little exercise. Is he living now, by the way? Is what? Is he living now? No, he died about 40, 50 years ago. Okay. All right. All right. Well, even though he's gone, it would be a worthwhile exercise for you, even though you may resist this now, Dave, all right, for you to be the one to give him some love for you to be the one to do it. If you can do it, it's going to help you. And even though he may not be here physically, let's make the assumption that it's going to help anyway, him. Yes. All right. All right. Can I interject? Please. Uh, what came up was, was when, he came up from the store at 11 o'clock at night. He was so tense. And the only thing that would help, he, uh, even though he was a pharmacist, uh, he couldn't take a lot of pills. And so the only thing that helped him to let go was to drink some scotch. And at age 10, I was assigned, because my mother was busy, uh, to mix his drink. 
and sometimes because I wanted him to relax more, I would pour a little extra scotch in, and he would see that, and then he would say, David, you're rotten, you know, but it was when he would get really drunk, the only way that we had any control or hope for it was I twisted his arm behind his back, and he I can still see the grimace on his face, even though he was totally drunk, and the pain and so forth. So what you're talking about doing is certainly appropriate, so I can help myself to let go of some of the deep guilt and shame of hurting him when he was drunk. Yeah. And so when somebody's in that kind of pain, they got to get drunk all the time. I mean, that's just one reason people drink a lot is there's a lot of pain. Yes. You, bl you blot it out and so on. Yes. I mean, that's real pain. That is, if you saw, if you saw someone who wasn't your father, in that kind of pain and you had not been subject to that criticism and everything else, you just saw them for the first time, but they're in that kind of pain. Would you not react with some, some form of love, help, etc.? Yes. 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 Okay. So you get to do that. Now I understand all the past pain of your own is in here, but Every, please. But What's coming up, I can feel in my arms uh, a vibration. What it seems to be is anger coming up in the body and yeah. the, the whole idea of letting this go. <laughs> well, but that just that it, that it. Well, yeah, but as, as a practical matter, as a practical matter, many people who let these things go, their resentments and angers go, end up with a for a while, at least, a sort of void. They're so used to beating somebody up in their own head. They're so used to blaming, etc. As a way, as a way of, although they don't realize it, as a way of getting their own unrest outside of themselves. Ah, oh, I've got all this unrest inside me. I can blame him. It's all his fault. It's all his fault. It's all his fault. Now you yeah. turn around and love him. Yeah. And you can't do that anymore because it doesn't work. And there's a void. I'm telling you that a void. And you're probably, I'm guessing, you are angry about you don't want to let go of that because that means you have to walk out of that prison as well and you're used to it. Yeah. How am I doing? Yes, right on. Right on. All right. Yes. Mm. So we may or may not get there in this session, but as you go through it more and more and more, my guess is it's going to chip away. But let's see how far we can go. Okay. So anyway, there's your father in front of you. All that tension. And there's you with the unseen therapist. You have an advantage he doesn't have at this moment. You've got unseen therapists. He, does, he has her as well, but he, he's not listening. Go ahead. I'm crying from the stomach, <laughs> ironically. Yeah, it, it seems to fit. Is that a healing sentence? I, yeah, it's it's a sense of healing, but the, the tears seem to be coming from my stomach. Okay. All right. All right. Well, good. All right. So unseen therapist is with him. He's just not, he's not listening. Okay, you have not been listening for years until you got introduced to unseen therapists, and now you're starting to listen, and some things have happened well, and so on. And, and right now, there you are with unseen therapists. You don't have all the capacity yet to do this on your own, as you said. Okay, yeah, right, right. So, unseen therapist asks you, Dave, I want your permission. You sort of see me as somebody outside of, or something outside of you. I'm actually within you. And I want your permission for me to just blend right in there with you right now. May I do that? Absolutely. Please okay. do. Please. Okay. So there she does. She sort of blends within you. She's, that's where she belongs because that's where she is. She isn't really out there someplace. Okay. She's in here. And get the sense 
get the sense of her being in there, this ultimate love. And however you can do this, even if it's mild for the moment, allow her to take all the angers and the hurts and the resentments and fill you full of nothing but her, your love at this moment. Let all the rest of it sort of ooze out of the angers and negative stuff, ooze out of your pores, your resentments and angers at your father and ooze out of your pores. There's only love. There's only love. And you look at your father and your father sees you and sees in your eyes. Only love. No longer is there a scared child. There is somebody who's going to love him that he's never experienced before. So as best you can, start radiating this love. Start radiating it. When you radiate it, you still keep it. In fact, the more you radiate it, the more you generate it, the more you have it. It radiates and radiates towards your father and all that tension. And take some, I see you crying. Am I correct? Yes, you're correct. All right. See all that radiation. There's the tension in your father. First time ever for him. He doesn't even know how to accept this, but somehow or other he's going to do it. And you notice because of your love, the tension in his body starts to soften. The tension in his face softens. The tension in his eyes, the anger in his eyes, the I've got to project all this out softens. Spend a few moments now on your own doing this. Imagine all the love within an unseen therapist radiating out to your father and watch the tension come out. And then maybe you can hear him say, David, thank you. I love you. See if you can imagine. Just spend a little time doing that over and over again until you've gone as far as you can go. And when you have done that, open your eyes and you and I can then talk. Okay. Okay. So what went on in there? Well, I radiated, radiated love. He looked at me for a moment like he couldn't uh, quite understand what was happening with the love I was radiating. And then it was like all of a sudden it hit him. And uh, he said, 
Thank you, David. I love you. And then uh, he said that again, and I radiated more love. And then we both stepped forward towards each other and hugged each other. Uh, and I said, Dad, I love you too. And that was just so painful I, in a healing kind of way, you know. Uh, because when he was dying of lung cancer, we sat at the kitchen table in his home and he said, David, you can touch me. And I think that was, that was a cry for love at that point. And, but of course I couldn't touch him. I was filled with rage, you know, and selfish, but <clears throat> anyway, it was quite, quite painful when we were hugging and telling each other that we loved each other. <clears throat> I'm curious when he said, David, thank you. I love you. Um, did you buy it? Did you buy it? Did you buy it? Did you believe it? I don't think at first. And I think there were, the initial reaction was resistance. Uh, but when we hugged, it was just like, it seemed like the walls came down. <laughs>